Well, this is a pregnant pause, isn't it? Um, okay, so welcome everyone um, to this event on phenomenography and phenomenology in talent network learning research. Uh, my name's Brett Bly. I'm going to chair the session. I'm one of two co-directors of the Centre for Technology Enhanced Learning here at Lancaster University. Um, before we start, I'll just say a few things that uh, should be of uh, consequence to you. The first is, as it says on the screen that uh, I'm currently sharing, this event will be recorded and the intention is to make the recording available later on YouTube. So um, just be aware of that. If you do share your um, video or audio that you may well appear in the recording. If you don't want to do so and you want to ask questions and so forth, then you can still ask questions in the chat. But if you don't want to appear in the recording, then please do turn off your camera and microphone. Otherwise, we actually encourage people to leave on uh, their cameras uh, for the simple reason. I mean, I've given um, Zoom talks before. It's actually rather nice from the point of view of being a speaker to know that you're not talking to a, what appears to be an empty room. But we'd encourage you to keep your microphone off unless um, you're specifically intending to speak. Otherwise, we can get various interference effects. Um, the present event is really working at the nexus of three different initiatives. Um, the first is that the Department of Educational Research is hosting a set of events over the next uh, sort of three months uh, under the heading of Celebrating International collaboration um, and this is one of those events um, there are a number of other events I'm going to talk about the next two at the very end of this one but basically if you're interested in going to the series of events and there are many over the next three months please do look at the department's website um, and you can register for those from the links uh, on the main page um, the second is that this is a meet and eat event. So this is a series of events that the Centre for Technology Enhanced Learning has been running for a couple of years now. This is actually um, event number 13 in that series. So I hope no one's superstitious. Um, and the history is that we meet around lunchtime and talk about something intellectual with people who are engaged in actually working on that. So there's usually some pre-reading. It's a combination of a reading group and a discussion group. And in recent times, of course, that's moved online, but we still hold it at lunchtime and we still encourage you to eat and drink while digesting the intellectual content. And the third is that the Centre for Technology Enhanced Learning is associated with the Network Learning Conference, which is a very well established international conference many of you will be familiar with. And the Network Learning Conference funds a number of um, initiatives around its periphery. And we noticed in the centre that two of those events, as in all two of those events this year, um, were being hosted by members of our centre, associate members of our centre. One of which is an event on phenomenology hosted at Cardiff University, and the other of which is an event on phenomenography hosted at the University of Malta um, by our two present speakers. And since these two strands of research are by some people easily confused and by those in the know are interestingly counterposed, we thought we'd host this uh, event to discuss the commonalities and differences between the two. So that was the gestation. Um, so therefore, you can see that there are quite a few things you might want to take into account if you tweet about this event, which many people like to do, including the hashtag for the Celebrating International Collaboration strand, the um, Twitter handles of our center and the department. We've got the Twitter handles of the two speakers and also the Network Learning Conference uh, for whom this presumably is an early opportunity to open discussions about these two strands of work that are important to that um, field. So the structure of the um, session, this session will last about two hours or so. Um, and we're going to invite Maria to speak first and then we will have a few questions and then there is a scheduled comfort break so you won't be stuck at your computer for the full two hours without a break. We'll then go to Mike afterwards and have a, a few questions about his and we're aiming to have an interesting um, plenary discussion 
uh, to draw out cross-cutting themes at the end. So that's broadly the um, format. Because of the fact that I'm sharing my screen and trying to record things and so forth, and also chairing, if you do want to ask a question, it would be useful if you can say so in the chat. So there have been occasions in previous online events where people are using the put my hand up function, but because they're off the bottom of my screen, I can't see them. So if you do want to ask a question, please do say so in the chat, and I can either read out your question or call you to ask your question as you prefer. So um, that is the basic uh, format. And so I think we can move on with the first part of the event. So Maria, if you'd like, I'll stop sharing my screen and Maria might share hers. Okay, now before, okay. before Maria starts, let me say that, um, and I have to say now that that has now gone off my screen. Ah, So I'm gonna introduce Maria. So. Maria Kutajar holds a PhD in e-research and technology enhanced learning from Lancaster University, a very good university, and a master's in online and distance education from the Open University in Milton Keynes. Maria is an academic staff member in the Department of Arts, Open Communities and Adult Education, which is part of the Faculty of Education at the University of Malta. Maria's research interests broadly, broadly focus on learning and teaching using network technologies in higher education learning settings and the adult education context generally. In learning, teaching and research enterprises, Maria is concerned with the experience and sense making of contemporary network technologies in situated learning and teaching practices. Through research practice, Maria has also developed an interest in the theory and practice of phenomenography and qualitative research and research processes more generally. So we're very much looking forward to your talk, Maria. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. Um, Signal team for uh, this opportunity to um, be part of this discussion on phenomenography. Oh yes, so um, I'll be talking on phenomenography. Um, I'll be using uh, a paper as a basis for my uh, for my presentation, which is teaching using digital technologies transmission or participation. Actually, I chose this paper because um, it, the paper itself lends itself very um, well for, for uh, setting out what phenomenography is all about. Um, so, um, if I can go, yes. Um, what I will be presenting here today um, and sharing with you is a brief uh, outline of phenomenographic research methods um, uh, as part of uh, the presentation. Um, uh, I will be um, sort of presenting an introduction to, to the phenomenographic research methods. Um, then I would be um, uh, calling to attention an example of phenomenographic findings and um, past that, um, I will be clarifying uh, phenomenographic underpinnings within the phenomenological uh, um, realm. And uh, um, on that basis, I, I will argue for, for transmission and participation as both significant and important facets of um, teaching and learning in uh, using network technologies. If I have time, <laughs> all depends, um, I will entertain the idea of phenomenographic outcomes uh, for theorizing, uh, teaching and learning, incorporating network technologies. But we'll have to see about that. <laughs> so, um, phenomenal, um, very quickly, a brief introduction. So phenomenology, phenomenography, um, lies with is a, a qualitative um, research approach. Uh, it is within the interpretative paradigm, and um, it sets out to map out variation in experiencing of a phenomenon the way it appears to us. Um, so, um, in in choosing to to do phenomenography, um, you are choosing to focus 
on the person-world relationship and aiming to set out um, different ways of experiencing the same phenomenon. As such, um, this, the spectrum of variation, which um, you will be um, targeting, um, would be a description of um, that the experiencing of the targeting phenomenon. So uh, I like to go back um, to this um, to this diagram um, first set out by by Bowden, um, where the researcher is um, is look is part of the part of the of the research in that. It is through the researcher that that relationship between the participants and the phenomenon is being set out. Um, and um, the researcher um, has a relationship with the participants and the phenomenon itself. So um, all the more um, the phenomenographic outcome is an interpretation. Um, it's an interpretation of the study phenomenon um, which the researcher configures from the participants' accounts. Um, uh, an observation by uh, Paul uh, Ashwin uh, back in 2006. Um, so we are, oh, through those accounts, we are uh, opening a window on um, the experiencing of a phenomenon. And the, this, ex, the, this um, window, um, we are opening it up um, as uh, different ways of experiencing, distinct different ways of experiencing, which are coming together through critical dimensions of expanding awareness. So um, in doing phenomenography, um, the data sourcing is, is popularly the interview, but not only. And um, some researchers um, say that it's uh, um, enough to do between 15 or 20 interviews. Uh, Bowden takes a more stricter uh, standpoint and uh, um, says that even up to 30, uh, participants should be the target. Um, the data analysis for okay. <laughs> so the data analysis um, would be the reading and rereading of the transcripts as a collective, um, starting with annotations, but not content analysis, um, to set out. Um, to, to let emerge from that data the distinct uh, categories of description, distinct ways of experiencing, which uh, iteration after iteration of setting out those categories of description, um, the links between those, um, those distinct categories are identified uh, in order to make up that spectrum of um, variation. And I'm going to give an example of that um, using um, networked um, teachers' experiences of networked uh, technologies for teaching. But before we go to that, um, I uh, want to also point out that uh, issues in, in doing phenomenography have to do with the reliability of those uh, findings, which one is, is trying to, to um, constitute from, from the, the data. Um, so ideally, more than one researcher is involved or um, in some way bring in uh, someone else into the research in order to ensure uh, reliability in terms of uh, a coder's reliability and that dialogical reliability um, in the sense that those, those distinct ways of experiencing are actually coming out of the data. And 
also um, validity checks in the sense that what is being proposed, what is being con configured, con con constructed by the researcher to some sense um, is, is um, valid, is convincing to the research community and especially to those um, for whom uh, th th those results will come in useful, which um, to most extent would be um, the people within the situation wherein this study is um, is contextualized. So going on Maria, to- Maria, sorry, this is Kang Mi. Uh, could you please make your screen full screen if that's possible? Oh, okay, sorry. The font, it's a little bit tiny. tiny. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't realize that. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> and so, okay, network learning. Um, so the, the idea of using network technologies for, uh, for teaching and learning. Personally, I argue that network learning um, in consideration of the definition we give it, it's an idealistic uh, thing. It's an aspiration to perfection. And uh, um, the degree to which we approach that perfectionism um, uh, depends on, on uh, the teaching and learning episode. So um, when I um, did an explore the teachers uh, experiencing of teaching using network technologies, um, I came up with this with this um, phenomenographic outcome space where where in in the most restricted way there is the experiencing of um, network technologies for teaching as the accumulation of subject content for um, for giving a teaching uh, a, a study pack to the students. Um, so that they do well in their studies. A more, um, a, a less restricted uh, way of considering uh, the use of network, um, using network technologies for motivating and accommodate the students to engage in their learning. So, so the idea of using, for example, video clips to help them in their understanding, or to make um, the, the, the learning a bit more exciting, or to help them um, study flexibly in their own time if they haven't time to come to class, for example, and so on. An even more uh, elaborate way of, of using network technologies was the building of the teacher-student rapport, the, the uh, awareness of the two-way communicative aspects of technologies and their use for reaching out to the students. An even more elaborate way of how network technologies for teaching um, could be considered would be modeling behavior wherein the, the, the academic um, is using technologies, playing a role model for, teacher, for, for students to follow on and um, participate and produce. Um, the most elaborate way of experiencing network technologies where, was the case where um, the academics were pursuing the use of network technologies for fostering a learning community and seeing themselves as part of that community, even as learners within that uh, community, not only as, as leaders, as teachers, so um, these um, different ways of experiencing network technologies were, were configured to coming together by the perceived uh, affordances of technologies, the human roles and the pedagogical strategy, um, which was uh, being uh, perceived most suitable for the teaching episode. So putting them together, I came up with uh, this model um, where, where the perceptions of, of the technologies, of um, the roles people were playing and the pedagogical strategy 
within a teaching and learning episode was changing um, uh, according to um, the situation, to the perceived, uh, to the perception of um, that situation um, in time and in space and in place. Um, so, um, considering this model, um, we need to also uh, consider the un underpinnings of, of a phenomenographic space. And um, in phenomenography, um, there are three constructs um, coming from the phenomenological field. Um, which, on which um, phenomenographic findings um, are, are held. Um, the first one is Brentano's th principle of intentionality, the, the Gerwitch's structure of awareness and the concept of representation. And I'm going to briefly go in through these three concepts in order um, to, to use them for going back to this phenomenographic model um, to take it uh, one step further. So Brentano's um, uh, theorem of intentionality um, points out that um, when experiencing something, you have the act of experiencing and the object of experiencing, like the learning, the learning of something, and you have an intention of that learning, and the same with understanding, with conceptualizing, and so on. Uh, Martin and Booth um, deconstructed a bit further um, in the sense that the experiencing itself, you can again deconstruct it into the meaning of that experiencing, and that is the what, the referential aspect technically, and the how, the actual, the actual object of experiencing. Because between the intention and the actual, there is a bit of a difference um, in learning and experiencing and so on. Uh, so um, in do these are entangled, uh, but as researchers, we need to be conscious on what we are focusing in doing research. And um, even um, in the data, we're going to find these entangled and we need to be conscious of them. Um, even though they are very, very difficult to, to disentangle in practice. So um, the structure of awareness, um, which is the second phenomenological concept, um, it tells us that in considering a phenomenon, you have what is called the internal horizon and the teams and the team uh, making up uh, that particular phenomenon. But that particular phenomenon we are experiencing um, in a thematic field, in a particular situation, which, um, which is embedding the, the, surrounding, the surrounding context of that experiencing. So, um, and that may, um, is going to impact on the particular aspects of the phenomenon which we will be foregrounding. And um, the last construct is the construct of a presentation, which continues to tie up um, with the other two const constructs in the sense that um, while in phenomenology, a presentation is taken to be the capacity of experiencing more than we are actually con capturing with, in the, with our senses. In phenomenography, it's a bit distorted in the sense that in foregrounding some of the aspects of a phenomenon, we are able, we are able to uh, make a whole experience of it. So it's a bit distorted. So taking those three constructs back um, to our, to, to, to the phenomenographic outcome, and uh, pausing for a moment on that, um, if sort of, if I don't um, 
take those three constructs in consideration, I may uh, take a step back and would be saying, oh, well, those, the first three categories are, um, are projecting a transmissive, um, a transmissive teaching uh, attitude, while the, the fourth and fifth constructs of the phenomenographic model, they are um, projecting a participative um, attitude. So, um, so um, the transmission of content, the transmission of understanding and motivation and accommodation, the transmission of caring. Whereas participation as modeling learning behavior, participation as membership of a network network of, uh, of learning network. But in foregrounding those three phenomenological contracts, the phenomenographic space takes a different um, turn in the sense that we depart from that um, idea of a watershed, of a distinction between the transmission and the participation, but we are seeing um, the experiencing as an emergent um, expanding um, awareness, depending on the situation in time and place. And uh, so you have the transmission of content expanding into the transmission of understanding and motivation, which is expanding to a caring attitude, which is expanding. So depending on the situation, depending on the on the place, the space, and what we are making of the of the teaching learning episode, as teacher, teachers, we would be assuming um, one um, one uh, way of experiencing teaching using network technologies or another, depending on the situation and what we are seeing at that point in time as best for purpose. So um, uh, transmission and participation in this sense, they are not as in contrast to each other, but they are different perspectives, different perspectives which are both important and significant. And with that, th there is a sort of a confluence of the, of the, two, the two teaching metaphors. Uh, these two popular teaching metaphors, which Sfard back in 1998, um, she wrote a very brilliant paper um, where she used logical argumentation in order to, to um, argue for this. So um, I'm not sure if I stop there, um, if my time is up, um, which I think it is. <laughs> You can have a I'm little sure. more time if you if it's useful to you, Maria. Okay, so <laughs> yes, thanks. <laughs> so, I'm good. and I um, I leave you more with a question and a conundrum rather than uh, anything. Okay, so um, yes, um, bringing together um, two studies that I did, one with the students and one with the with the teachers in the same teaching and learning context um, of a university complex, I was finding that uh, in the most elaborate category, the teacher's perspective of um, what it means to be using network technologies for teaching and the student's perspective of what it means to be using network technologies for learning were coming together, not exactly together, but approaching each other. And the more uh, intriguing um, thing was that the, the constituted critical dimensions of awareness, which were, which were upholding those structures, were actually uh, coming very, very close together as well. Um, from the learner's perspective, um, a critical uh, dimension was the affordances of network technologies for learning and the teachers for teaching. 
for the learner, there was the, the, the critical dimension of the epistemic agency and the engagement for learning, whereas for the teachers, it was the pedagogical strategy, um, the idea of setting out the epistemic tasks for learning. And um, from the learner's perspective, what, there were the human relations for learning, and from the teacher's side, there was the human roles for teaching and learning. So um, from this, these observations, I am seeing that sort of the learner perspective and the teacher's perspective, they are looking at the same phenomenon of network learning. But um, foregrounding uh, different aspects, and in the most elaborate, in the most elaborate um, way, they are coming together. They are matching. A sort of there is a confluence in this. So um, there are some who claim that teaching and learning are uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, would this make for it? I don't know. It's um, an interesting uh, observation, um, which I will continue to pursue. Um, uh, but um, in the formal learning and teaching um, context, um, they are really coming close, but um, it, is this an uh, idealism? Is this uh, um, an aspiration to perfection? Uh, what I started with, um, about the network learning um, approach. And I'll leave you with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening on. And uh, um, I really would like to hear your thoughts about this and uh, um, discuss it. So, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. That was a really interesting and thought-provoking presentation. Um, so we now have a few minutes for uh, questions specifically on Maria's presentation. If anyone would like to pose one, please do say so in the chat and I'll um, either call you to speak or read it out as appropriate. Uh, while people are collecting their thoughts, I can certainly start with one question, which is, um, it won't surprise anyone who knows me at all to know that my, my theoretical background is very different from this. Um, so for, for me, the first question that gets posed is what do we mean by the phenomenon? How, when, we, when we say all these people are experiencing the same phenomenon, how do we know that? What assumptions are we making there? Is a phenomenon something that somebody's given a name to, like they're all experiencing network learning, or is it something else? How do you, where do you start off as a researcher with that? Uh, um... When we're talking about a phenomenon, first of all, a phenomenon, um, I consider it is something of the world which we are focusing on. And I see it as something recursive, um, sort of a phenomenon consists of uh, many different phenomena um, within it. it. You can go in and out and remain with a phenomenon. So it's... Um, some part, some aspect of the world as, and in doing phenomeno, phenome, phenomenography, um, you are focusing on that aspect of the world, that particular aspect of interest, um, as it appears to us. I'm not looking for the essence of it. I'm uh, just looking as a phenomenographer, how it's, it appears um, to us, um, in relating with it, because that's the only way that I know it and I can know it, in experiencing as it appears um, to me. <laughs> so, 
I'm not sure if I'm... Uh... <laughs> Uh, very, very interesting. I mean, it, it's always, I wonder whether sometimes you think you're investigating one phenomenon and then realise somebody's talking about something different and you have to decide whether that's really part of the analysis or not. Uh, there's a comment from Sejin, I think. Did you want to say something, Sejin? From? I would like to then... Uh, Brett, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you uh it's it's just it's a comment and i'm what it's pretty far up there from me okay yeah um i think i mentioned i like this interpretation that transmission and participation can be joined as one process of learning and kung me uh, mentioned also the um the coin metaphor uh, could suggest that they are opposite rather than coming together. And I uh, answer to that, then we can propose a wave metaphor. So in the process of learning, learning or teaching can be surfaced in the process. So yeah, that was my um, comment. Thank you. Truly, uh, thank you. Um, for uh, for this uh, comment and this proposition, seeing um, seeing it more as a wave, um, the coin as can be interpreted as opposites, whereas the waves the waves they are coming together they can they can superimpose each other, they can move apart, they can come one and the same thing. Um, not sure if I'm understanding this uh, metaphor, which Sean, uh, you um, But uh, yes, it's a, it's a very strong uh, way of, of um, considering it. I'm, I'm not sure if you are understanding it in a different way than I am. Um, there are a number of comments. Um, I, I almost feel like I should summarize them because there are about three people asking very similar questions about um, your experience of analyzing phenomenographic data and, um, and and partly there's a rather concrete concern with how long that might take but what kind of what was your experience of doing that like for a, a fair-sized project <laughs> oh well uh, so um <laughs> uh, it's a long process um on your own um it always took me about seven, eight months um, working on it uh, in order to try to come up with a convincing, um, convincing model. And it starts first with um, the annotation of the data, because um, that even helps you to start getting the data under your skin in a way. And, uh, um, you know, and uh, and um, bringing the collective of transcripts together as a collective, because in doing phenomenography, you're not looking at an, in what a particular participant is saying, but you're looking at the whole collective. Um, so uh, that makes it an even bigger monster. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, reading and reading um, uh, the data and and cap capturing those excerpts first of all you have to start filtering the data um, because uh, as brett uh, pointed out earlier about the phenomenon uh, people might be talking about very many different phenomena than the one you are targeting so so 
in the first readings, you are filtering out uh, what um, is not um, what is not uh, relevant to to the particular uh, phenomenon uh, you are targeting, and uh, progressively, um, sort of you. Personally, in one study, I kept to the whole transcripts all the time. In the second study, what I did in an early stage, I filtered out uh, what was not relevant. I, um, I plugged out all the excerpts which um, I found them relevant to the study and I remove them from the transcripts to make it a bit easier on me. Uh, in, the, in the earlier study, I kept all the time to the full transcripts, but I was highlighting them. I was spinning colored notes to them uh, to, to keep note of, of the different meanings that were emerging in the transcripts because in one transcript you might get several different meanings that the phenomenon is being uh, given. Uh, so um, yes, it is um, a whole process of, of reading through the transcript, sorting, resorting uh, the data in order to try to make out the different meanings um, it is being given. Um, personally, I prefer to stay away from, from trying to also, also um, uh, devise the dimension, the critical dimensions in an early stage. But um, after, in both cases, after the fourth iteration, it started coming out of its own. The, the dimensions, the critical dimensions of awareness, uh, pulling together those distinct me meanings, um, sort of, as a researcher, it, it's always very exciting um, to start seeing the, these, the, these uh, dimensions of awareness uh, emerging and um, uh, you know, um, in a way, it's a sort of a discovery. In a way, it's a sort of a construction because as a researcher, you are seeing these threats coming out and you're making also trying to make sense of them to bring together um, those different meanings into a neat, a neat model, because after all, um, uh, the, the reality is much more complex than a neat model, which you obtain with phenomenographic, um, uh, with doing phenomenography. Um, I don't know if I answered that question well. I'm, I'm going to go out of order with the questions because I think that Margaret's question about the number of categories. Margaret, I don't know if you want to ask that, might actually um, kind of continue on from those comments. Uh, yeah, thanks, Brent. Uh, thanks, Maria, for the delivery. Really intriguing. Um, using phenomenography, I'm using it myself as um, a PhD student at the moment, and I'm in my final year, and I've done my categories, and I'm kind of writing up. Um, my question is, you get so much data you analyze. And I've been filtering and filtering um, my categories at the time when I was data analyzing. And I came from, I think maybe 15, 16 categories, uh, narrowed down to, um, to, um, to six uh, categories that emerged. And I appreciate, right? At the end of it, I saw the value of that through my supervision to say, no, you've got to make sense. You've got to think about this. You've got to do that. How many in your view, when you've got that vast amount of data with you, in your views, how many are reasonable 
I take it to that in phenomenography, what is making sense per your analyzed data is what has to qualify as your category. Any personal experience you, you went through when analyzing your data on this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the the problem of of of, of data it's um, it's a, a very real one and the, the because because you are looking at a collective in phenomenography um, it's a, it's a big issue now in in the second study which I to in order to try to make it a bit more manageable um, I. I use the Swedish method of, of um, removing, um, filtering, filtering out the, the transcripts, that collective of transcripts and pulling out the excerpts. Uh, when I was doing my doctorate, um, I, used, I used another strategy in the sense that I had some 32 transcripts, if I remember well, yes, it was 32. But what I did, instead of considering all the 32 together, I considered um, about 25, if I remember well, 25 of them, um, for setting out the for the setting out the categories of description and and um, the initial model, and then I was bringing in the rest of the of the of the transcripts in order to sort of verify the model that was uh, being built. And that gave me some breathing space. Right. Um, so uh, I don't know if that is answering your question about how to sort of uh, try to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Maria. Yes, it, it, it does. Uh, I'm pleased that you did as many uh, interviews, so I I feel I can relate to uh, to your experience to an extent because I carried out quite a lot of interviews, right? And it's it's been a refining process. Uh, it was a refining process at the time when I was trying to um, analyze that data mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, and come out with my categories. And um, I was quite happy in your talk, you you did uh, cross that path to say that you've got to listen over and over and over and over until you start dreaming about them. Thanks, Maria. Yes. And um, the first time you do phenomenography, it happened to me, I was sort of saying, all right, what I'm going to obtain um, it's, so, it's always going to be a window, a partial view. And what if the next, the next interviewee will tell me something which will add to that spectrum and make it even richer? And it was a sort of, I remember my experience finding it hard to stop. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't know about the ideal number of categories. I do remember Noel Entwistle came to our department once and sarcastically noted that the ideal number of categories for any situation is two. Um, but I do know about the ideal number of questions, given the number, the amount of time we've got left. So we're probably going to be able to cover about two more in this section. Um, so Jean-Baptiste, you've posed two questions at different times and they're different questions. So perhaps you could just choose one of them and pose it. That might be... Um, enough for now if that's okay okay hey <laughs> um maybe the uh, second one then um because i'm not very familiar with that I'm, I'm just studying at the moment but uh, um some authors i don't have the name in my mind now but are studying the pre-conscious and conscious and consciousness in 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 phenomenology so um when we talk about um studying the uh, the people, their behaviors, uh, and we interview them and we kind of get a sense of, uh, we, we understand what, how they make sense of a, a particular phenomenon. They obviously talk about what they're conscious, what they're aware of. Um, I was wondering how we study um, the unconscious part of it. 
I don't have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and neither do phenomenographers. Okay. <laughs> because in phenomenography, you're looking at, at, at um, how the word is appearing to, to those people you are interviewing through their descriptions of how they are relating to that phenomenon. In fact, even when um, sort of in drawing the accounts, uh, you would be asking them to describe uh, situations where they are relating, where one is relating to the phenomenon. Um, it, it would, in, in order to generate the data, rather than asking uh, people, what do you think of that phenomenon? Uh, you would go about uh, sort of uh, that phenomenon. Can you describe a situation? Um, like, for example, in teaching, uh, can you describe to me a teaching episode where you, um, in my case, it was um, using um, technologies, using digital technologies and all that. So um, basically, um, you're not directly dealing with the unconscious, though, though having said that, in doing phenomenographic interviews, um, some claim that you are approaching a therapeutic session in the sense of leading your interviewees um, to reflection and saying something that even they uh, didn't think about or were not conscious of mm. earlier. So um, that's as far as I would get, however. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, there's, Felicity, your question's very good, but actually hinges on the difference between the two things we're gonna talk about. So if, if you don't mind, I'd like you to ask that question in the, um, in the discussion at the end when we're comparing the two, because that's also about phenomenology, right? Uh, there's another question, which I mean, I guess the person to phrase it might be Kyung Mi. So there's been, um, there's been a discussion in the chat uh, based around Paul Ashwin's contribution, which says that really it's the phenomenon should be framed in such a way that it's understandable to the participants. And Kyung Mi had a follow on question from that. Did you want to ask it, Kyung Mi? Um, yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Brett. So the question is, how can we make sure that our, you know, we, when we come up with the categories and name it and try to communicate with the participants, how we can make sure that those are our conceptualization of their, their experience of the phenomenon, it's making sense to them eventually. How can we check? Mm -hmm. um, I I believe, I believe it's uh, the headache of every researcher and not only phenomenographers, but any researchers who are trying to see things from the viewpoint of others. So um, yes, um, it, is, <laughs> it is the one billion dollar question in a way. Um, you t as research, Personally, I always believe that in doing research, you can never totally, totally write yourself out of the research as a researcher. And I, I start off from there. But having said that, having said that, um, if as a researcher, you're trying to um, see things from the perspective of, of others, of your participants, um, you have to keep um, an eye on on yourself as well, all through, all through, and keep on. For example, every claim you make, you uh, take it back to the data. See if the data um, is um, see if there you have the evidence for what your claims. Um, all the time you have to be checking on yourself whether you are um, taking the natural attitude, uh, sort of your natural attitude of, of uh, imposing your own 
your own ideas, your own beliefs, your own assumptions and, and presumptions. We are all humans with our own um, natural tendency. So um, as researchers, I believe that it is as much about the research as it is about ourselves and sort of, um, in a way, keeping ourselves in check, um, sort of, uh, in order to let the data be telling you um, what, uh, what is to be rather than um, my own beliefs as a person. Um, so, yes, it is. Um, but at the same time, um, so it, basically you have to watch our biases. Um, okay, uh, so thanks Maria, in particular for the very in-depth way in which you've addressed the questions. Uh, we're going to move on to Mike's presentation next, but before we do, uh, in the interests of mercy on everyone concerned and, and their need for caffeine, We've scheduled in a five minute break, just enough time for a kettle to boil. So I'm going to pause the recording and hopefully we can all convene again in uh, five minutes from now for Mike's presentation about phenomenology. OK, so I look forward to seeing you all again then. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, and I hope we're an hour ready. I'm not sure who's the light side and who's the dark side in this little dichotomy at the moment. Who's You'll the find Sith? out in a minute. <laughs> who's the Sith and who's the Jedi or whatever is your favourite franchise. But we're about to find out about phenomenology from Mike. So before Mike starts, I'd like to introduce Mike. So Mike is from the School of Healthcare Sciences at Cardiff University. Mike Johnson is a lecturer with an extensive focus on IT in the practice of knowledge work. Mike's scholarship has been oriented to the field of network learning for most of the last 20 years. Mike's work has often explored what being good with information technology means in educational settings. Mike's PhD work, which was at Lancaster, involved approaching that issue through a phenomenological lens. More recently, Mike has been seeking to deepen his understanding of the phenomenolo phenomenological branch of philosophy and methodology. In 2020, Mike started a Wikiversity learning project about Gadamer's truth and method, and has recently launched with Felicity Healy Benson, the Hamford Initiative, which seeks to explore the issue of phenomenology in network learning. And if I may say so, Mike, I think you made that text about as difficult to read as any, as any biography I've had to read in recent memory. But we're very much looking forward to your um, presentation. And there was only one word of Welsh. Just wait till you hear what phenomenologist in residence sounds like in Welsh. <clears throat> I've been practicing that. Phenomenologist Presswell. Yeah, that's it. Anyway, right. So um, very, very briefly. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about phenomenology <laughs> and then I'll talk about my use of it. And then I'll talk a bit about the paper that I've adverted um, in the blurb in the run up to the session. So it's a great privilege to present this to you. I hope it's useful. And that's the, that's the reason we're all doing it and why we're here. And um, just a great honor as well to present next to Dr. Maria Kudija. So uh, it's, it's all good. I'm just delighted to be here really. Um, so mm, I'm gonna start by saying that I'm assuming three things and I'm. I'm fairly tightly scripting myself because I've horrible tendency to waffle. So you'll find that out when we get to the question time, probably. So I've got like three things to kick off by saying my audience is primarily those interested in exploring methodologies for a particular educational research project, or whether you're a postgraduate researcher or whatever. So professional phenomenologists and philosophers, please be nice. Uh, assumption two, anyone who can talk as if they have a full understanding of phenomenology is probably a professional philosopher. I seriously doubt that I will ever be able to grasp phenomenology. Um, assumption three, uh, values and beliefs. This is where it gets interesting. Now, 
This is about the human, human sciences and complexity. Uh, what a person is, um, because I'm interested in learning, right? And that is a human thing. So if we think for a minute about what a human is, uh, I know that socio-materialists and uh, post-humans, post <laughs> post-human researchers uh, among you might take a sim similar view derived from, I'm not quite sure what exactly, but um, you know that I've got to the bit in Gadamer, this book, here it is, this one, Truth the Method, wrong way around, uh, where he talks about prejudice, very important section and the inevitability of them, right? And we've already been referring to that a little bit this morning, uh, this afternoon. And that they're not always bad, actually. Gadamer makes this point. There is a, like a primordial or radical historicity of our being as researchers that Gadamer refers to. Now forget about the informants or your participants or your lab rats, forget about them now. I'm talking about your own um, historicity of your very being as researchers and the significance of good as opposed to less good traditions and how that plays out uh, gets to be quite important. So unlike with Act and Outward Theory or others, um, my way out of the Descartian dualism of mind-body is through the ancient Jewish stance on how humans are constituted as a radical unity of soul-body. And there's still something uncanny about humans, that's Heidegger's word. And that includes learning. So that, that sort of serves me up into this position, which is quite difficult um, in terms of complexity. I want to honor complexity as much as I can. So let me, I think these are insights that I've been infected with from um, probably interpretive hermeneutic and existential phenomenology. So let me try and explain a little bit about transcendental descriptive phenomenology as philosophy. Many of you will have heard that Husserl, if that's how you say it, is the father of phenomenology. So it makes sense to try and understand what Husserl had to say. Yeah, I make a lot of use of audiobooks. Uh, especially for dense texts. I chip away at them everywhere on a dog jog. You probably want to see the dog. Um, just a sec. There you go. There's the dog. The things have got better already, haven't they? <laughs> it represents... So, so Husserl's ideas, right, it was published in 2013. And so it's an attempt to describe lived experience before it's reflected on. So that's not like what we were talking about before, as in when you're unconscious or not really conscious, but it's before it's reflected on anyway, or so we do something with it or theorized about it at all. So this book takes 17 hours of listening to get through, and it is full of technical terms without which it's almost impossible to comprehend. So the only thing I really took from the first pass through those 17 hours is that I needed a sound grasp of the words he uses, like noema, noematic, noemata, noetic, etc., etc., apophantic, theatetic. Um, <laughs> so I'm trying to read <laughs> Truth and Method. Uh, this is the paper book now, just like two pages at a time. But before I go any further, let's get back to basics with Dan Zahavi. So there we are, uh, nicely summing up. Phenomenology means the science or study of the phenomena. So that's good. Uh, we can all go home now. Uh, that's a really short book, actually. It's just 10 pages. Um, oh, that were, were so simple. It's one of my favorite YouTube clips these days. Oh, that it were so simple. You've got to Google that later. So this is... Uh, <laughs> So this is making a point about um, trying to read Gadamer now. Um, I got to about page 171 um, of this book and found this bit of Latin, which of course I had to look up. Um, this part is really important argument. Um, as you can see there, part two, the, ex the extension of the question of truth 
to understanding in the human sciences. So he who does not understand the things cannot draw sense from the words. Kind of maxim, kind of obvious statement, um, but I think it should have been printed on the front, um, not on page 171. And then of course there's being and time. <laughs> <clears throat> so 2017 was the great year of my moving through from a fairly straightforwardly ethnographic approach in my thesis to a fundamentally phenomenological approach. Here he is. <laughs> my research, I really liked the sort of humanistic values and holistic methods of ethnography, but realized that my research question was less about discovering cultural patterns than understanding individual experiences. It's just found a bit of sun. <laughs> that was the sun. But it's like, you know, <laughs> just tell me what to do, isn't it? Um, and, uh, you know, some people say about phenomenology that it finds you as much as you find it. And in the moments after my supervisor said, I think Heidegger is a great place to start. It really helped me to stop flirting with the Warren portals and just really stick my head in one. Um, but my supervisor's advice at the time was actually really sound. You don't need to become an expert in these authors to successfully complete a PhD or perhaps any other research project apart from a philosophy department one I'm just an IT lecturer, you know, and, uh, but even that gets silly, right? Um, the mystique around this is, is quite ridiculous. Um, I usually tell people that expert is a relative term. So you're the expert in your use of the kit. Um, it doesn't always go down very well. But so you may well, at least in this setting, have better insight and could do a far better job than me in this presentation. But anyway, here we are. I get it. So what kind of use can we put phenomenology to in the context of education research? Before I can answer that, I need to point out that phenomenology is contested ground, especially when we try to apply it. So we've got these guys. These three have been writing fairly polemic articles. I don't know if you're aware of this and even books rubbishing each other on each other's approaches. And I think rubbishing is a fair term. <laughs> you know, this, they basically say things like, this person does not understand phenomenology, right? Um, <laughs> and actually I do find um, John Paley a little bit acrid. Uh, it sounds like he wrote the book by basically screaming into a dictaphone. Um, but you can make up your own mind for the logic of what he's saying. Um, with interpretive phenomenological analysis, uh, it is quite popular in health sciences and back home um, where, I, where I sort of exist, um, where they want to do qualitative research into lived experience, but they want to make it look like it's actually positivistic science. Um, Side swipe. <laughs> I attended a workshop about IPA in 2014 and I did find it quite alien in the way it treated the data which emerged from just a few interviews. Um, now I'm not saying that good work can't come out from these approaches, but uh, I have sympathies with Max in the middle there. And I think that's I'm, I'm on pretty safe ground when I when I quote him as uh, you misunderstand phenomenology because it's bound to be the case. Um, now, Max has been going for an awful long time, and I have to admit, a lot of what he says does actually chime with me. Uh, I feel a little bit apologetic about that, but um, anyway, there's his book. Um, yeah, and he's put an awful lot uh, of effort into it over the years. A paper by Jacobs I recommended uh, along with this talk uh, is straight out of Max's methods. Uh, Max talks about the importance of going back to the original sources, the philosophers, and for this purpose, that they can be powerful insight cultivators. And I really like that idea. Um, you know, it, it doesn't mean to say that we should be able to understand everything they say, 
but it does mean that they can jar or inject us into a different space in our thinking. Now, whether you buy, um, you know, what they advocate, these three, just three, there's loads of others, um, or the arguments that sustain them, at the very least anyone who's trying to do research by experience or perception has to cross the threshold of phenomenology a bit. So to give you some examples of insights that have cultivated for me, and especially Heidegger, um, because I was supposed to start with him, right? <laughs> uh, let's go to this slide. So there's me um, trying to help with the rollout of my progress for the midwives in 2015. These images are also in my thesis. Now these tablets could have worked, but they didn't work well enough for everyone. Um, they seem to do okay for me. Oi. Uh, but why was that? Why did some of them work and some of them not? Why did people just completely jib at not being able to use them? Uh, they were very, very cheap. They were like 30 quid, um, 40 with the cover, <laughs> uh, which was sort of important. Uh, all right, so this links back to that ongoing question uh, which Brett mentioned that's been plaguing me for ages, and that is what makes us differ, what makes us good at, or, or less good at IT. Some are really good, others are fine, actually, and, you know, it's just not an issue. Others are not at all good. And I wanted to approach th this phenomenon of IT use from the inside in case this would afford answers. And I came up with the question, what is it like to be a healthcare student with a mobile phone, which is hopelessly broad? Um, but that what is it like um, aspect of the question implicates phenomenology. And I guess I was running away from that and my supervisor kindly brought me back to it. Now, network learning research can get quite excited about the connections and the nodes and such like, but lose sight of the organic complexity of the world with all its messiness and unpredictability and and the few people in that setting um, non dualistically was my uh, thinking really so as a soul body phone if you like um, and thus I came up with this idea of um, mobilize I don't know whether you've ever heard anybody talk about that but here's the next slide there it is um so i came up with this fairly early on i think it was late 2016 early 2017 so this is before i'd really become phenomenological at all um i was thinking still thinking ethnography so you won't really see phenomenology in this slide necessarily although maybe it may be at chimes a bit i'm trying to write a paper about how we use theory to preload our consciousness as we proceed with a research product. It's a bit like uh, the ethnographic gaze you might have heard of. You know, everyone is attempting ethnography, says you have to have it, but no one can tell you how to get it apart from having a go. Uh, because in the process of data gathering, encountering the phenomena and trying to analyze or represent it, how do I know I'm looking at it right? Well, Gadamer says that we all have prejudices, as I mentioned before, we just have to try and make sure that the right ones or at least good ones. Uh, and I'm arguing that mobilage allowed me to avoid being distracted by the technology or the person and, and also kind of act like a knotted hanky, if you like, to implicate learning in, in everything I was trying to do. So um, it was, I, I just feel there's always a danger in research that involves technology that learning and even the human is is sort of forgotten. The point being is I'm viewing mobilage as a fluid system, very much held up um, practices by the context, ecology, society, and 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 even time and pa time passing. Uh, and this helps me to sort of cling on to that sense of complexity of what's going on um, as I try and encounter this phenomenon. Um, so let's have a little Heideggerian phenomenological lens to mobilize. And this is a pretty much a slide based on, on a section of the thesis. So if we just, I don't know if I've got time to run through this at all, but um, 
it's a pretty classic uh, dose of Heidegger philosophy, yeah, that you've got the ready to hand and the present to hand, and nobody can ever remember which way around they are uh, unless you're dealing with this on a daily basis. But there's the phone on the left, the ready to hand, it's just doing its thing. You're phoning somebody up, you're not really aware of the phone. Um, you might be checking the weather, you're not really aware of the phone. You're not even hardly aware of the weather. I never remember the weather after I've just looked at it. Um, and so there's this level of consciousness that the phone is existing in. And then on the left, on the right there, you've got some kind of breakdown. Let's say something doesn't quite work. You're losing reception. Suddenly you're trying to resolve a problem now and sort of start to theorize about it. And you can see that these are different ways um, that your consciousness is, is trying to cope with living in the world. So what I did was I contrasted Heidegger's object lesson for this, the cobbler's hammer, with the phone um, in use. And I don't know, I've just got six points there, but I, I don't really have time to go through them. Just take the one at the stop at the top there. Um, in terms of evolution, well, a hammer is still a hammer and a phone is not still a phone, is it? <laughs> it's an absolute nest. Um, a very well I mean the interwoven things going on um, with the phone uh, it's not just a ham and it's not just stuck uh, as a phone either even though we have icons that look a bit like a phone now and you, you wouldn't recognize that as a phone if you looked at that icon um, you know how many years ago just before the iPhone you probably wouldn't recognize that as a phone icon um, so it's not staying still and who knows how much longer we'll have phones anyway you know there'll be like in Doctor Who or something, you know, implanted into our brains or some terrible thing like that. But so, so this is apparently a sort of post phenomenological analysis and you can find this sort of thing in Don ID. But I would argue that phenomenological thinking started to infuse everything. Um, thus I started to shun transcripts. I know this sounds a bit radical, um, but this is where I ended up. Um, because a transcript is radically different to the encounter with mobilage. I was also, you know, I was different every time I looked at anything. And that starts to tip one into a bit of an existential crisis, actually. Um, and another metaphor that I quite like for this, and I've used this before um, in the Network Learning Conference, is, uh, is the kaleidoscope. And what's important about this picture is that it's not it is, it's a real one, not a computer generated graphic. There's some incredible ones on YouTube you could get, but uh, we're li really lit looking at a still of uh, a cheap plastic kaleidoscope here. Now, if you've ever looked down the 2D tunnel at the same lumps of refracting plastic falling around, um, the pattern is never identical. It's never the same. That's just some bits of plastic at the end of a tube. It's never the same, and neither are you. But it's always wonderful. And that's why we go back and have another look. Because although the words in our transcript, yeah, a nice, they don't change, but time passes. And your consciousness churns onwards somehow or other. And the experience can never be repeated in exactly the same way twice. So going back to my attitude towards written transcribes and tra transcribing and such, uh, what I tended to do was um, just listen to things a lot. And I had some um, field notes and some uh, media that I collected at the same time to remind me of what it was like to meet that particular mobilage, right? Um, I, I, I get haunted by this, even though the text stays put, you change. Right. So there's aspects of what's called distanciation going on here. And this is uh, the distance between text and speech. And this is Paul Ricoeur's stuff, Gadamer, as well in hermeneutic phenomenology. So there are a host of Heidegger's ideas. Uh, I don't have time to go into like throneness. I love that idea of just, you know, we're kind of <laughs> always being impelled forward. And so is the rest of the world. It's quite a uh, Again, a bit of existential uh, challenge. And then there's being itself. Being is everywhere. It's the darkest concept of all. That's really tricky. And then there's the whole care structure 
and mood and so on. Um, but when I get lost, I reach to max. Ah, some text that doesn't move around. And uh, to somehow you know, stabilize these ideas. Um, and his phenomenology of practice methods came on quite late on in my project to guide, especially the vignette work. So that means analysis through writing and rewriting and yes, rewriting. Um, so I ended up with this kind of thing on the next slide. Um, next slide, please, Brett. Oh no, it's me, isn't it? There you go. Uh, so again, this is pretty much straight out of the thesis. Just, uh, I could read this vignette, but I don't really want to. Um, <laughs> you can perhaps see the link here if you've read the Jacobs paper, um, that this is starting to look a little bit like the kind of thing they have there, um, where there's a blob of, um, of, of the account of what the phenomena was a bit like, and then there's a bit of discussion afterwards. I didn't do a particularly good job of the discussion afterwards, but um, it's what I was leaning towards. And then I've kind of found the answer. And the interesting thing reading the online dating paper is that um, there you've got somebody who's come through the training and it seems so straightforward compared to the messiness of what I did in 2017. But anyway, um, the effort here then is is to try and, uh, and this was an important concept again from the ethnography book, um, which is edited by uh, Paul Atkinson. Uh, it's called returning to presence or re-presencing. So that's what I was trying to do with this. I was, I was trying to bring you back into that moment where mobilage is there to be experienced. Does, I don't know what you find that this account does that, but that was my objective. And in phenomenology, it's called the phenomenological nod. I can't remember who coined that phrase. Kathy Adams keeps saying it to me. So I, I really don't want to reduce the phenomenon to themes uh, by slicing and dicing the data. Again, I, I feel that's a bit of a betrayal. <laughs> Controversial. So uh, there's there's um, like a red pill. Um, you can just carry on with your blue pill if you want. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, no prizes for guessing which one I took. But yeah, the online dating paper, um, when I read this, I just thought this is just incredibly powerful um, and helpful. And I'll explain why without really going into the detail of, of, of the paper necessarily, but although I could do that maybe in some questions. Um, so I don't know if you know the picture in the middle. Uh, the paper reminded me of this great film uh, from 2013 where you've got Ben Stiller. Uh, you see that, so that's Walter Mitty in the middle. I don't know if you've seen it. It's I really like it and it's kind of silly, but not as silly as the stupid superhero movies. Um, this is really quite sweet. Um, and then you've got it. So he's, I think it's Cheryl. Um, he's spotted Cheryl in work and likes it, but he hasn't got the guts to approach her and say anything. So he's now, he's overheard that, that she uses an online dating app and so he's joined the online dating app to try and give her a nudge. And he's done that because he doesn't have the confidence really to approach her and, and ask her out or what. Um, so that's very different in a way to the paper where he's trying to post a link to a lady he fancies, he's seen in real life and knows a bit about her, um, but she doesn't probably know very much about him at all. Um, and this makes a related point, I think, to some of Jacob's stuff about self-revelation online. Um, online, you get thin communications, which allow a weird kind of anonymity, a veiling uh, and a surveilling. And just to make the point that, um, I think it's a Greek term, aletheia, um, Heidegger makes the point that, um, that this is about unveiling. Um, and yet in online comms, very often we both veil and surveil. Um, but I can relate it directly to an experience that has haunted me for years back in 2000. I get haunted a lot. Um, back in 2002, I joined the Lancaster Sea Salt module on network learning. 
uh, they designed the program on a timeline that meant that students met each other online first, that is through text uh, in the discussion forums, that was it. Uh, uh, so that was asynchronous. And then they came to residentials, so like two weeks in. The residentials were far and away the best aspect of the learning and teaching strategy. <laughs> but they served to highlight the richness of embodied co-presence and the thinness of the virtual, albeit telepresence. And you can read Ben Cowald about that in the Network Learning Conference um, papers. But I really hope you get that from the article that I've um, referred to. It relates to the work we're currently doing with Kathy Adams to write a phenomenology of Zoom breakout rooms. We hope to do some of this with delegates to the event. Um, which I hope you'll all come to in June. Um, I think we've probably got room. One of the things that I do like about phenomenology of practice approach is the sense that I get that its heart is in the right place. Uh, it's not really, in fact, it's expressly not claiming to be philosophy, but it does prioritize wonder. And I wonder if you can identify whether the phenomenological attitude suits you or whether uh, it's choosing you. I just wanted to have a little pop at phenomenography. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire contents of this slide. I probably should allow you to see Malcolm Tight's face. I don't know if that's going to come through now. <laughs> it's not going to work, is it? Oh, it is working a little bit. At least you get to see his face if it pulls it through. Um, nope, there he is. It's playing for me anyway. There he is. Now, what you don't want to do, okay, is watch that very brief video um, just before your viva to check him out because he talks about the 40 books he's written and so on and so forth. Uh, in the event, I really enjoyed my time and repartee with him in the viva. Um, and it's, you know, it's found a very safe place in the liminal moments draw, um, you know, and it gets rolled out at dinner parties and things like that when we have them again. So that's very boring for everybody else. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, so basically he's saying that my next project is to read everything that was published uh, globally in 2010 about educational research. Great. Um, <laughs> but the bit I've highlighted there, only a limited number of ways, you can see why I would start scratching my chin about that. Um, if phenomenology, phenomenography, sorry, is only expecting to find a limited number of ways, I find that cuts against the grain. I find that threatens wonder. Uh, and I want to get drunk on complexity. Um, for a teetotaler, that's quite an extreme statement. And um, for me, wonder is the watchword. And again, Heidegger talks about um, how, how wonder is different to these other things. And, and I challenge you to think now uh, about how wonder is different. Um, think about that for a bit. Um, but I do need to finish up. so. If I can suggest that uh, you can find out more at our meeting in June, if you think that's a good idea. And we've got some really interesting people um, helping us out with exploring phenomenology. Um, I just, uh, there's, I don't think Felicity's still in the, she's still here, yeah, she's a bit of a ringer in the chat there. <laughs> and I've got some references for you as well. Um, so that's the two of us. We started this little society um, because the places that we hail from are a little bit uh, worried about COVID and doing new things. So uh, we just decided to kick off on our own. And as I said before, we now have beanies and badges. So watch out. And I'm going to embarrass Felicity and ask her to show us the beanie, which has just arrived like today. So that's pretty exciting. Have, have I run out of... Uh, is that okay? I think I probably should stop there. That's great, Mike. Before I Thank embarrass you. myself anymore. Um, Felicity. We're still waiting for the beanie, I think. But yeah. uh... okay. <laughs> Can you see me? Oh, she's not wearing it as well. Oh, yeah. Very good. It's awesome. This is, I, I, I haven't cut my hair since COVID, so I thought I'd hide it. <laughs> What's my excuse? <laughs> Look at that. 
it's the mad professor look, which is funny because uh, I'll never make professor, <laughs> especially not after today. <laughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm obviously impressed by the talk, but slightly upstaged by the beanie there at the end. Um, so it's probably uh, a, a, you know, had a dog, I, right? Had no <laughs> you've chance. got a dog too. Yeah, it was always dangerous. Um, let's make an attempt. I mean, it's always going to be uh, very difficult to accomplish, but let's make an attempt in the remaining time. Let's spend sort of five minutes talking about this presentation. And then we'll try and um, have a bit of a plenary at the end. So does anyone, first of all, have any comments specifically about phenomenology rather than the contrast or commonality between the two? Um, I mean, my question is partly about you were quite disparaging of participant reflection, I thought, at the beginning, like the phenomenon exists before it's reflected on. But actually, um, your reflection is extensive. So this is, is I mean, I'd say you're probably not going to disagree with me, but is this, is this a very, very researcher-oriented stance you're taking here? This is, this is all basically about the researcher reflecting on this through endless iterations, but the participants not doing. Is that what I'm getting here? That's how you produce the vignettes? Yes, um, I haven't. I, I'm. I'm not a fan of uh, member checking. It won't come to any surprise. Basically, it's. I it stands or falls on what happened between my ears. Um, Any more? I think Kim Mi had a question. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, it was very enjoyable, um, but I just want to ask a question probably on behalf of everyone here that, so <laughs> just tell us what to do. Like, so if, you know, especially when you, you specifically mentioned that you don't want to theming, but which is like cementing analysis is of most like basis of all qualitative research that we so, kind of train our students. And then, so if yeah. you don't want to theme it, how are we going to do about this phenomenograph, uh, phenomenological study? Um, oh, don't get me wrong. There are phenomenologists who will do slicing and dicing. <laughs> so you say but, uh, you mean is slicing and dicing? Yeah. And okay, in fact, um, in fact, uh, if, I mean, I haven't really got this out yet, which is bad, but I've been too busy with other stuff. But in my thesis took three bites at the at this um, thing, this phenomena. Um, the first one was through a survey. The second one was online focus group. And the third one was vignettes. Um, and especially the second one couldn't avoid going for categories. Um, so I've done a bit of that, but I haven't really published it. And yeah, there's more that I could do with that. But um, so I'm not saying you can't do good work with that. Um, and it's not useful work. And it's something to do, right? Rather than this craziness that I've been talking about is kind of in, unhinged. And, and you sort of have to have this belief that there's going to be something at the end of it. Um, but I have to say that there is. <laughs> there's a pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. Curious, Mike, how are you, I, I do get the um, slight opposition to certain kinds of categorization, but you're still producing a set of vignettes at the end, right? So what do those vignettes represent? Presumably not categories, but something else. They're represencing, Brett. They're not <laughs> representing anything necessarily. Um, so it, what it's supposed to do is, is it's supposed to affect us. And you know, we're, uh, I think probably Kathy Adams has made this point as well to us in Hanford uh, meetings um, that there's a there's a very strong sort of moral and ethical issue that starts to emerge um, as you re reflect on these things and start to pull in um, ideas from the insight cultivators, and and it really does have a powerful contribution to make. It's not like necessarily something else, and you sort of have to believe it um but um it's 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 there it's transparent in its method in as much as it could be thank you so we've got sort of 
just over 10 minutes left now, sort of 12 minutes left. So I wonder if we can um, have some semblance of a plenary. Um, so if people have questions that draw out points of commonality or difference between the two presentations, we might be able to pose them to Mike and Maria together. Um, now, I don't know if, uh, I hope you, you remember it, Felicity, but you, post, you posed a question um, much earlier that did seem to do that. Did you want to ask that question now? Okay, yeah, let me just go back to it. Uh, where was I? Back, 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 back. Gosh, there's been lots of chat. Um, okay, so obviously the uh, Maria's presented the second order perspective. So, and the phenomenological uh, perspective is from the, the first order perspective. So I was just trying to establish um, what, um, you know, why is one more or less advantage, uh, advantageous to the other? Um, and, and, and with that answer, um, what it brings more or less then to the network learning context. What is, in a very simple terms, what does phenomenography bring to the table that phenomenology can't and, and vice versa? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if Mike wants to. Not really. <laughs> okay, so um, in, in, to my mind, uh, I'm not um, that, um, um, very much familiar with uh, with phenomenology as uh, uh, in all its uh, <laughs> glory, but uh, to my mind, in for the case of, of phenomenography, phenomenography is giving you a description of um, distinct ways of experiencing a phenomenon, but. Um, um, in a particular situation, in fact, in fact, it is not generalizable. Um, and in, whereas in phenomenology, um, you are looking at the essence of what the phenomenon is. Now here I stand to be corrected. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 I get that, and, and to be fair, I, 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 and to be honest, I don't see, to be honest, I, I, I kind of, my, my particular stance is, it's not about me saying one's better than the other, so do kind of hear me on that, I do, I'm very much one of those people that, you know, I believe we need all lenses to bring insight into, into the world, um, but I, I kind of, if, from my perspective, I feel as an educator, as in a practicing educator, as a lecturer, um, amongst other duties, um, what I feel that's kind of magnificently missing from, from understanding is the sort of more kind of um, the sort of more pedagogically responsive insights, the sort of covered over the kind of the the sensitivities and thoughtfulness that that's needed in in pedagogic practice that's quite difficult to get at and so in my mind it's just that <laughs> i'm kind of almost kind of like sort of trying to stop the battle here and sort of say that they each have their place but they're coming at things very differently and i get more upset when they get muddled up together yeah. <laughs> so, it's, so it's when people get them confused is more problematic um, and there's very few papers there. I picked up one, I wish I could remember it, but there was a paper that was run um, in, a, in a, a, a hospital setting where they looked at almost the same, same similar, or similar phenomena, but they did it from a phenomenographic and a phenomenological perspective. And interestingly, they didn't dispute each other's finding, understanding that could actually work together. So, yeah, so it's a kind of almost sort of like defeating the object of the battle year. It's like a, like a draw. But um, I just, my, my, my passion is to um, ensure that people do each well and not get confused. <laughs> That's yeah. more my sort of um, interest. <laughs> 
actually more actually, trouble when, when Nietzsche get back to you. Dif different reasons. They are messy and people do get yeah, people do get kind of confused. They see phenomena, they see the word phenomenon, and they think that they are rooted. And I know you mentioned that there's some roots back to Brentano, but there is some very magnificent turns then that 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 take them on very different paths. And um, you know, yes, it's the first versus the second order, there's the group perspective versus the you know, individual participants. But I think we're 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 on the side of on at least I'm on my, um, I'm mopping my brow in the in the in one corner, sort of saying look we're trying to get at the what's concealed, what's covered over, you know the stuff that's quite hard to sort of put your hand on, and even when we do frame it in language, we we we, we don't actually capture it fully because we kill it if we actually name it, mm. and it's a lot more subtle, um, and it's more philosophically underpinned. And, you know, I, I was reading and listening through your insights as you presented them from um, the lived experiences of um, from, your, from your learners and your educators. And I was saying, yeah, I could actually pick away from that and it could sort of help me with um, um, sort of like maybe reading and, and understanding, reading around those concepts. So it's not that I would put, uh, not look at phenomenal feminographic papers. I would still turn to them as an educator for insight but I'm also looking and encouraging um, educators and researchers, just like yourself and other people, to also not sort of turn away from the magical wonder and openness that Mike, I hope, has, um, has kind of outlaid today in his presentation. Um, the different research methods are targeting different things. And I believe, all different research methods have are opening different windows and uh, giving you different perspectives of things. So I don't I don't see like phenomenography and some phenomenology in battle with each other. Or you know, um, it depends what. What you are after mm -hmm. um, will will decide your qu the questions you ask, and uh, will will determine uh, what research methods um, you you employ in in order to answer your questions. Um, sort of, it's not a question of um, one <laughs> is um, better than the other or or the other is inferior to the other. Um, uh, with regards to, um, yes, I see phenomenography is rooted in, in phenomenology. Um, recently, I read a paper of last year uh, of Stoltz, and he argues that uh, uh, phenomenography would exist better within the folds of phenomenology. Um, yes, <laughs> uh, I'm sure. I'm not sure. I, I, um, I agree to to that uh, that uh, sort of sort of um, argument. Although, although, um, yes, I. Some of what what the author was saying about, about uh, phenomenography, um, you know, sh sharing, sharing uh, its philosophical underpinnings with, with phenomenology, I agree to it. I don't agree with a statement like in phenomenography, one is picking and choosing um, which, which uh, theoretical concepts, uh, because for me, the theoretical concepts, which I pointed out in, in the presentation, for me, they make sense. And I'm not sure I managed to convey that in the presentation, but for me, those three, those three phenomenological uh, concepts, they come together and make up a whole structure. They fit one into the other. It's not just a question of picking and choosing. So, um, yes, um, it depends what you want to do. 
there is a there oh, was you, do, you, do, you, do you do you have understanding of um why um phenomenography uh, sorry phenomenography dominates though um in terms of it's for the appetite for it in the network learning context why do you think that is why is there more sort of interest in phenomenography in, in the network learning context in the research? Personally, I know I do not see phenomenography dominating in network learning because um, in, net, in, in the field of network learning, I, I, I come across all sorts of research methods being used in, in, in network learning research. Just, just relatively. Just relatively, if you if you take the network learning con uh, con uh, conference, um, if you look at the papers, um, into it does there is more phenomenography than there is phenomeno phenomeno phenomenology papers. In, in, in part within the research group, um, uh, there were people interested in phenomenography, and obviously they're going to affect others. So so naturally, <laughs> you um. It, uh, one leads to another. Um, so, however, if I, Maria, if I can just interject, because time uh, is pressing, we've got about one minute left. Um, so, I mean, I think that one answer, Felicity, might be it's just so much easier to say, as your question proved in itself. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for present. We've had a fair few comments, I should say, including, I'm sorry we didn't get to Don's question about complexity, because I think that we had a fair few comments that oriented around that, including the notion that the categories are not just different ways of experiencing, but qualitatively different ways of experiencing, which is why that there are a limited number of them. Um, so we've had a number of discussions in the forum, uh, and a lot of that was kind of going on, which you might not have seen while... Um, while verbally talking. So there's been quite a rich textual discussion going on as well. But unfortunately, um, the two hours has flown rather quickly. So I'm going to draw this to an end um, because I have to, rather than because I want to, but I'd like to just, I hope you can see my screen that I'm now um, sharing. I'd like to um, draw your attention to the fact that this sequence of events has a sequel. So the next two events in this series um, are, are, well, the next one is on Friday, the 23rd of April, where we have a show and tell, which is our center's series of research and development workshops, uh, an event with Julia Gillen from linguistics and Philip Benashaw from computing and communications, talking about establishing trusting relationships with international partners, and then the next meet and eat event like this includes a whole host of speakers celebrating the launch of a special issue of a journal focused on technology enhanced learning in the Middle East. So if you enjoyed today's event, hopefully many of you will uh, seek to reconvene over the coming weeks. But the whole sequence of events, which is about celebrating international collaboration, is um, listed on the homepage of the Department for Educational Research website. So I'd like to end by thanking both Mike and Maria for their contributions and to everyone who asked and posed questions both verbally and in the chat. I hope you found it very useful. I'd like to also remind you that the recording for this will be um, posted on YouTube once we can get it sorted out, which usually takes a couple of weeks. So if you want to relive this, then you can. And we'll also post the links to the various resources that were uh, mentioned, okay? Thanks so, so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that one, Mike and Maria. It was great fun, I gotta <laughs> say. <laughs> it was really good. But, uh, not to be repeated, I think. <laughs> well, literally. Okay. <laughs> Let's clear off. <laughs> <laughs>